Today, I'm answering all your top questions. I get asked so many questions as a fertility doctor, and today, I'm just gonna pick some of them and answer. Here we go. If you follow me over on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, I asked, what do you want to know? Ask me anything. And today I'm going over some of the top questions. We're just going to dive in and get into it. Can you feel ovulation? If so, is it normal? Can you feel ovulation? And if so, is it normal? I love this one. So not all women can feel ovulation, but some can. If you can, it is not a bad sign. It actually is a name. It's called middle schmerz really long word and it is German. It means middles of the cycle. So mid cycle, it is your mid cycle pain. Ovulation happens in the middle of your cycle. Fun fact is that many women think that your ovaries alternate which side you ovulate from and that's not true. It's totally random. And also if you only have one ovary because one was removed, that, new, that ovary will then ovulate every month. So you'll still have monthly periods even if you have only one ovary. When you see a low morphology score, do you always jump in to IVF? Okay, so real quick, morphology is the shape of the sperm. So what this person is talking about is when you have a couple who's been trying to get pregnant, male partner gets a semen analysis and has a low morphology. So that means the shape of the sperm, there's more abnormal sperm than normal. Most sperm are abnormal. And so sperm can be, sperm is so weird. But so if you have a low morphology score, it does mean that you have a much lower chance of getting pregnant per month that is only semi-corrected by doing IUI, which is intrauterine insemination, or by doing lifestyle changes. So there are some things that make sperm bad, like smoking cigarettes, marijuana, likely high sugar diets. Heat is a big one. And so by avoiding some of those exposures, maybe it can improve. Now, abnormally shaped sperm have been associated with infertility and higher rates of miscarriage and aneuploidy. So it's definitely something that as a fertility doctor, I progress to more aggressive treatment very often, but it depends on the full picture. How old is the woman? How many eggs does she have left? How many kids do you want? So you really want somebody to look at the entire picture. What is the best advice you have for a teen who wants to go into medicine? Ah, career in medicine is great. Welcome to the club. Uh, I was you. I always wanted to become a doctor. I knew that's what I wanted to do. I didn't have any idea that I'd be a fertility doctor. This career I didn't even know was possible. But my best advice, go to a college that's going to support you. And that's not the same for everybody. You don't have to go to an Ivy League school. Get into a place that's going to give you support. Maybe that's close to home. Maybe it's a big school with lots of resources and activities. Maybe it's a smaller school because that's how you learn better. I didn't really do much in high school. I knew I wanted to go into medicine and so I made sure to go to a college that had a pre-medical program. I started to volunteer at a free clinic and that gave me so much good exposure. I actually volunteered there for three years. That doctor who ran that clinic wrote a letter for me when I applied for medical school that probably is the reason why I got in. A question for you as a mother, what helped the most I'm prepping for your kid's birth. Um, I was not prepared. I was not prepared. So I think this is one of the hardest things that we do is we plan a lot for pregnancy. We focus on the pregnancy. We focus on the nursery. And you know, a lot of my patients focus so hard on getting pregnant, but suddenly we're left with a lack of support in that postpartum time period, which is so hard. I wish I had been more prepared for breastfeeding. I wish I'd had more support and been less afraid to ask for the help that I needed along the way. So I didn't do a good job preparing. My daughter came early when she did. It was like, I had no idea what to do. The nurse like handed her to me. She said, do you want a breastfeed her? And I said, yeah, handed her to me and shut the curtain and walked away. And I had no idea what to do. How to get hormones back on track after taking, oh, how to get hormones back on track after taking the pill. This is like, mm. If anybody is selling you a supplement that you need to now take to get your hormones in check after you stop the pill or, or calling it a post birth control pill cleanse, they are scamming you. They are scamming you. That's not a real thing. You don't need that. So please stop, okay? Birth control pills come out of our system very fast. That's why you have to take a pill the, around the same time every day for it to be in perfect use in preventing a pregnancy. Therefore, your hormones are going to rapidly return to normal. But a post-birth control pill cleanse doesn't exist. What other career would you choose if being a fertility doctor wasn't an option? I would open a restaurant. I know, it's probably a terrible idea. I still really wanna do it. We'd have vegan food and wines and coffees and that's what I would do. I still am trying to convince my husband to do it now on the side. 
What can cause a high AMH level? Is it always a bad thing? It's not always a bad thing. A high AMH means that there are a lot of eggs that have come out of the vault. If your periods are regular, then it's not a worry at all. One thing, however, that can be associated with a high AMH is PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. We have a whole video on that, but that is associated with irregular periods. And it's not that the AMH is a bad thing, it's just a reflection of all of those eggs, which may be preventing you from being able to ovulate. Why does DOR happen to women in their 20s? Okay, DOR is diminished ovarian reserve. That is when your AMH level is very low, it means you're running out of eggs. So essentially there's fewer eggs in the vault, and when the vault starts getting closer to empty, it starts releasing fewer eggs per month. So that AMH is higher, the more eggs that are remaining in the vault, and lower, the fewer eggs. Low Low AMH is called DOR, diminished ovarian reserve. That means you're going to run out of eggs sooner. There's different reasons why. It can be autoimmune. It can be genetic. It can be environmental or exposures. And we often think a top exposure may actually be when your mom is pregnant with you. How does the Mirena IUD affect future fertility or AMH levels? It doesn't. The Mirena IUD is a progesterone-based contraceptive device. It is a little device that goes in the uterus that can last for five plus years, but it does not impact your future fertility. It can be removed and you can start trying immediately. The one thing to think about is that if you have amenorrhea with the Mirena IUD or any IUD, that means absent periods. It's because the constant progesterone exposure thins out the lining of the uterus. You probably want to remove your IUD about six months before you're ready to start trying to get pregnant. That way your lining has time to build back up with further ovulations. Make sure you use condoms if you're not ready to get pregnant during that time. How do you have confidence after failing a board exam and not letting it affect you? I'm lucky that I've not been in this scenario, even though I know people who have, who have been fabulous doctors and it has nothing to do with their ability to take care of patients. It's usually just due to a test taking situation. I think the most important thing you have to do is know that it's not you that you know the information, and then you need to set yourself up for success in the future. Confidence is a really hard thing. When you have it, you're riding high. When you don't, it's really hard to gain it. Know that one test score does not define you. I know that when you study and prepare for a test and then you don't perform how you want to, it makes it feel like you just wasted your time. They're all stepping stones that are gonna get you where you wanna be. Really take the time to understand how you learn best and set yourself up for success in the future by making a study plan, taking time off of work. When I took my last test, which was an oral exam for reproductive endocrinology, it's a terrible test where you have to go sit there in rooms with board examiners. You just submit all your cases for a year. They look through them and they tell you, oh, I probably have my case log. Let me get it. Here it is the dreaded case log. So what this is, so you can say I had to do these different sections and I had to put up things about them. So it's all de-identify, but it's how old they are, their case, lab values, what I did, what the outcome was. And like there's, there's pages of this. There's three different sections for the REI exam. There's one on reproductive endocrinology, which is all your endocrine disorders. There's one on infertility and reproductive surgery, which you submit two case lists for. And then there's your thesis. Half of my fellowship was research. I did a thesis. Mine was all on natural fertility and luteal phase defect. And you have to have a publishable paper. I've got two. And you have to sit there and defend your papers, talk about research and stats and study design for an hour. Oh, lordy. But I spent forever studying for that. And so, I actually went away the week before the test and left my hubby and my kids, went up and lived with my grandma in Dallas for a week. Taking that time off of work was really helpful for me just to get out of the patient care mentality and being able to focus in on that exam, which I knew was so hard. Thank you guys so much. This is probably the most fun episode I've had to record. So I hope you like it because I'd love to do it again. Feel free to give me a thumbs up and leave in the comments, yes, you want more and you can write out a comment. I'll pull the next set of questions from the comments here and then I'll do another Instagram poll again. As always, you can follow me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, or you can listen to the As a Woman podcast for more in-depth episodes on fertility. If you like the YouTube channel, please subscribe. That just helps more people see our message and spread fertility information to all. Thank you.